From Cody ears to your eyes, we discuss Tuesday's OTA, Stroud and Mill splitting reps, first team reps, hearing from Nico Collins, and is there trouble in the DB room? You are Locked On Texans, your daily Houston Texans podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in, everybody, to a Wednesday episode of the Locked On Texan Podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And as always, shout out to our everydayers hmm. from the Himalayas. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NFL and enter promo code locked on. They'll throw you a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler. With every order, I am John, some sports guy Hickman. Of course, I'm joined by none other than Sports Illustrated's own and Houston Texan credential media member, Cody Davis. By the way, if you are new to the Locked on Texan podcast, be sure to subscribe on YouTube and, of course, wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Today, we are talking about Shaquille Griffin's practice debut and is there trouble in the DB room? Steven Nelson mm. has not showed up to OTAs as of yet. Hearing from Nico Collins and why his main goal, as you guys can see, is staying healthy this year. And, of course, week three OTA takeaways. This is where Cody is going to bring it from his eyes to your ears. And if you're watching at home, your ears and eyes as well. Before we do a couple of on the field observation, excuse me, from Tuesday's practice, multiple plays were being made down the field by receivers. CJ Stroud had a couple of 40 yard completions on the day. So, you guys, as we talked about stretching the field and Nico Collins being a part of that, hearing that CJ Stroud is out there making these 40 yard bombs is a positive. Derek Stingley. Second year, former third overall pick, wasn't tested much <laughs> during the day. So for all of you guys that, you know, maybe more more so the national media wrote Derek Stingley off. He isn't being tested at practice, and I think year two is going to really set off his career. C.J. Stroud and Tank Dale. And if you guys remember the story from draft night, I won't Tank Dale. That whole story, right? Well, C.J. and Tank hooked up for a – Big completion on fourth and 15 to pick up the first down. And Brevin Jordan, which is a guy mm. we talked about on yesterday's podcast in that tight end room, whether or not he's on a bubble, Cody, he has some good moments during OTAs. But again, from your eyes to the listeners and viewers, ears and eyes, Cody, when you look at Tuesday's OTAs, what are the takeaways? Like what are some of the things that – the Texan fans, the fan base should be excited about. And then I'm going to ask you afterwards, like go into detail if you can, what are some of the things where it's kind of like, whoo hold on now. This is why <laughs> we are in the OTA period to get this team prepared for the preseason and the regular season because this area or whatever needs some work. Well, of course, Week three OTAs, you got to go back to the quarterback room. That's been the biggest story. Um, the first week of OTAs, Davis Mills took first team snaps. Second week of OTAs, CJ Stroud took first team snaps. On yesterday, they split first team reps. And look, Davis Mills did take the majority of first team reps, but um, Coach D'Amico Ryans and his staff did a very good job um, basically splitting first team reps with both of those guys. And at first, John, listeners and viewers, seven on the seven, 11 on the 11s, you know, things was, you know, subpar for both quarterbacks. Um, I do want to mention this, and it's probably something that we're going to talk more about on tomorrow's show. Look, we have all we are all expecting this defense to be really really good, but this secondary man, my God, <laughs> this secondary looks good. I know it's early, and for those of you to understand how early this is, they don't even have pads on as of right now. They are still in t-shirts and shorts. But this secondary, the way they are flying around, the way they are making stops, the way they are making plays on the ball, 
I don't know how you look at this secondary and you cannot get excited, especially when you consider the second year development of a Derek Stingley Jr., John, as you just pointed out, um, the second year development of Jalen Petra. Um, the 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 addition of Jimmy Ward, like this secondary is going to be phenomenal this year, and I can't wait to see it in full in full effect. But this secondary had a very good day doing seven on seven, doing eleven on eleven. As a matter of fact, um, they tipped several of C.J. Stroud's passes. Um, they held C.J. Stroud doing eleven on eleven to a three and out. And when in terms of Davis Mills, Desmond King actually it came away with an interception. The biggest difference between Davis Mills performances and CJ Stroud performances on yesterday came in the situational purposes. The Houston Texans drew up a situation. The offense was down. 21 to 7 to the defense with a minute and 10 left in the fourth quarter with a ball on their own 40. Um, Davis Mills went three for five, did not score in a, the red zone. I'm not going to lie. Davis Mills had me questioning his ability to thrive in the red zone because there were several passes that were tipped. Um, his last pass attempt was, was, was a near interception. However, CJ Straw. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Same situation on, I want to say it was the second play of that drive, of that situational drive. CJ Stroud connected with wide receiver Alex Balkman for a 30-yard completion. Of course, they had them first and 10 deep in the red zone, and the drive ended with CJ Stroud connecting with Omari Rodgers for oh, yeah. a touchdown, man. I'm not going to lie. Looking at C.J. Stroud, basically just go through his reads, and his accuracy is there. I know I opened up talking about the secondary getting to C.J. Stroud, tipping his passes. However, I do want to mention this. Hearing that lets you know how good this defense is going to be, but also lets you know how good C.J. Stroud is going to be. Going into the draft, I know a lot of people was high on C.J. Strauss's ball placements, his accuracy, and I'm telling you, it's there. And it was shown during the Houston Texans situational purposes. Man, C.J. Stroud continues to look good. I do want to mention a couple quick takeaways. John, as you just alluded to, Brevin Jordan had a really good day on yesterday. Happy to hear that because, as we mentioned on yesterday's show, um, OTA's training camp preseason is going to be very big for Brevin Jordan. He had about two or three catches doing 11-on-11 and team situationals as, as well. Case Keenum connected with Xavier Hutchinson for a 31-yard completion doing 11 on 11. Like I mentioned, man, I know it's still early, but Xavier Hutchinson really has the potential to be a very reliable wide receiver for the Houston Texans entering his rookie campaign. I know a lot of people are excited about Tank Dell. I am too. However, Xavier Hutchinson, the potential, the skill, it's there. And as we're going to get into later on in the show, um, Shaquille Griffin had his practice debut with the Houston Texans for the very first time in OTAs. We're going to get into him and what's going on with this backfield, especially with um, Steven Nelson, with him missing all of OTAs. However, Shaquille Griffin had some good and bad. The bad he had not one, but two pass interference calls. <laughs> you know, this was the first time on Tuesday that uh, Dalton Schultz had an opportunity to speak. And uh, he was asked about why did he, uh, well, I'm sorry, he was asked about what would it take for this team to sign him to a long-term deal. His response was, to be honest, I don't really care about that stuff right now. Just putting it first and foremost, like I said, coming into this, I'm just happy that I can play for another year, whether mm -hmm. that's on a one-year deal, four-year deal, or a 10-year deal, whatever it is. I'm just really excited that I get another shot at making a deep playoff run and ultimately winning a Super Bowl, and I think that's what I'm most focused on. All that other stuff I'll leave to my agent and I'll let him, let him kind of dictate and whatever he says comes to go with, kind of, kind of go with. Uh, I wanted to point out that I'm just excited to get another shot and making a deep playoff run and ultimately winning a Super Bowl. 
Ooh. Does that sound not for the immediate season? Of course, this is not a Super Bowl team. <laughs> I don't think this is a deep playoff run team. Although I am on record by saying I think that they can make the playoffs by winning this division. But mm-hmm. does that is that a positive for Houston to hear a tight end of Dalton Schultz caliber, top five, top six tight end in the NFL? Um, that you know, right now he's focusing on getting another year, but eventually. Does it sound good hearing him say that potentially this team can make a deep playoff run, can maybe make a Super Bowl run? How does that sound? Guys, I would love for you to comment on YouTube. Let us know your thoughts about that. But hearing from Dalton Schultz for the first time, uh, I think during these OTAs was one of the positives simply because he is an outside vet. We've heard from the rookies. We've heard from, you know, we've, we've, we've heard from, a lot of the vets that came in, maybe not from necessarily winning situations or vets that were already on the team. Dalton Schultz just came from Dallas where regardless of how we feel about the team, the city, I know Cody with thumbs down, Ooh. but they've been an explosive offense. And Dalton Schultz has been a big reason for that, right, at the mm-hmm. tight end position after the departure of uh, Jason Witten. So he knows what it takes to put points on the board and be a successful offensive team. Uh, I think that's a positive to take away to hear him say possibly deep playoff run, Super Bowl run, all of that. Um, he, this is a team that I think needs to lock down Dalton Schultz. They have failed to really put a good tight end on the roster for a consistent basis since Owen Daniels. So I think Jordan Akins had a good year last year. Jordan Akins is a guy that I think if the relationship between the Texans and Deshaun Watson would have never soured. Maybe he could have been that off- that offensive weapon at that tight end position. But Dalton Schultz is a really good player, and he's also in a very favorable offense. We talked about Gary Kubiak and, and, and Bobby Sloak trying to, you know, replicate what Gary Kubiak was able to do for Houston years ago. Owen Daniels thrived then, and I think that Dalton Schultz can thrive now. I think his comments also showcase that this franchise is – really moving forward with their rebuild. And if you go back and take a look at what veterans and even the coaching staff had to say over the last two seasons, they talked a lot about development, having patience. And it was understandable because this team was still trying to find its way, still trying to lay the foundation. Now they believe that they have the foundation in place. And John, as you mentioned, you know, of course he's not talking about winning the Super Bowl this year. You got them as a playoff team. I don't have them as a playoff team, but I'm not going to lie. If they do end up making a playoff run or be one of those teams where it's the last two, three weeks of the regular season and it's like three scenarios have to work in the Houston Texans' favor to where they can possibly be a wild card team, I wouldn't be surprised at, at, at that. However, this is the first time where we are truly starting to hear a veteran actually place some expectations for this franchise for the future. And that's very telling because once again, this is not a veteran or even a coaching staff because I haven't heard coach D'Amico Ryan's talk about patience and development and taking time with the young players. I really haven't heard none of that ever since the conclusion of the, of the draft. That's very telling man. And in this team, they are on the verge of something special. And to go back to yesterday's show, when you talked about the offense, John, I think I put it the best way possible. This might be the first time where everything is lining up for the Houston Texans all at once. You know, it's not like you have everything across the board, but you need a franchise quarterback. It's not like you have everything across the board, but your run game is bad. You know, it's not like you have everything set on the offensive side of the ball, but your defense is starting to slow down because they're older and then injuries are starting to play a factor. No. The Houston Texans are on the verge of something special. And within the next two to three years, I wouldn't be surprised if Dalton's expectations is really starting to look like a real possibility. This episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Bird Dogs makes you look good. Let me tell you why. Those Bird Dog stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. With those Bird Dog shorts, Listen, they do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but they fit way better. They fit better than the regular shorts that are made of a stiff, restricting cotton because Bird Dog, let me see what Bird Dog did for you guys. They invented a cloud knit fabric 
that looks just like the khaki but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. You know what I'm saying? Go to birddogs.com slash locked on and enter promo code locked on NFL for a free Yeti style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NFL for a free Yeti style tumbler. You won't be able, well, you won't never want to take these shorts off. I promise you that. Mine are coming in the mail. I had some a few months back. And when I tell you they made my legs look like Jenna Jackson, real good. So once again, birddogs.com slash locked on NFL. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NFL, promo code locked on NFL. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to this Wednesday installment of Locked On Texans. And we're going to continue with our takeaways from week three of OTAs. And on yesterday, we had an opportunity to hear from Nico Collins. Now, Nico Collins had a pretty quiet day on yesterday. But last week, for those of you guys who saw the show, um, Nico Collins and CJ Stroud, man, that, that connection between those two guys looked really good. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he had about – three or four catches and one of them was alone was a long um pass attempt between him and CJ Stroud and I think that CJ Stroud is going to be the quarterback that can really help Nico Collins become the wide receiver that we are all expecting him to be however we talked about it a little bit last week I want to return to this conversation because the number one issue with Nico Collins is his health You know, yesterday we had an opportunity to talk to Nico Collins during his media availability. And he said out of his own mouth that remaining healthy is his number one focus. Yeah, yeah, man, um, a lot. I feel like I'm going to focus staying healthy, uh, being available for the team. Um, So I feel like my focus is come in every day, man, and do what's best for me. Um, Get down the routine um, and stick to it. Trust the process. Um, Being there for the team, balling out, making plays. It was definitely, man. That's my goal. That's everybody's goal. Stay healthy throughout 17. You know, it sound, sound easy, but it's hard, you know, but just sticking to the process, trusting your routine, and, um, and just keep going, man. Just getting better every day, for sure. Ever since Nico Collins began his career with the Houston Texans as a third-round draft pick in 2021 that they traded up for, if I'm not mistaken, um, Nico Collins has only appeared in 24 out of a possible 30 four games last year his sophomore campaign came to a premature end due to a foot injury and unfortunately that marked the second time Nico Collins had a foot injury in his career and in addition to his foot injury Nico Collins has also battled with a groin injury and a shoulder injury John if we revisit this topic what would a healthy season do for not just Nico, but but for this entire offense? Because me personally, I look at Nico Collins as somebody who can definitely take that step and take the helm as this team's number one wide receiver. And the only thing that he truly needs to do, of course, but a quarterback play, and I think that's coming with C.J. Stroud, but the main thing he needs to do is remain healthy and the one thing that he said you know even though he was disappointed in having his sophomore campaign come to an end due to another foot injury he said that they gave him an opportunity to truly focus on getting better for this upcoming season I think a healthy season for for Nico and he said 17 I'm a realistic guy I'm saying between 14 and 15 games right things happen throughout the Mm -hmm. season that you can't really prepare for. But I think if he plays around 14 to 15 games, that's fair, even 13 games, right? But I think a healthy Nico Collins, what that would do is give him an opportunity to solidify himself a part of – I'm not even going to say number one, but just as a valuable option for this team at that wide receiver position moving forward, right? Uh, Robert Woods is 31. He signed a two-year deal. I don't see him being a part of this – rebuilding or building process for the next three, four years. You have John Mechie, right? But he's coming off the recovery. Got a lot of these young rookies that we have expectations for. Nico Collins is the only real seasoned vet that's been on this team outside of Mario Rogers who got, came in midway last year. But the guy that you really have the higher expectations for 
and it's been held back because of bad quarterback play, but he's been injured. So I love the fact that he's he is addressing that. I think again, him being on the field for 13, 14, 15 games, that gives his own self a shot. Now for this offense, one thing that I loved um coming from Nico when, when you guys had an opportunity to talk to him yesterday was he mentioned how let me go right to it. I already know where you're going. Right. <laughs> so gonna love this. <laughs> you know, he, he was asked about the other receivers he studied who has a similar body type and plays in this style of offense. You guys want to know who he mentioned? Hmm. Julio Jones. He said, yeah, Julio Jones. Coach Lloyd pulled clips from Atlanta, and, and he watches Julio run it. Uh, mentioned that the San Francisco concepts, the same offense, that they did in Atlanta. They did it in the San Fran offense, Kyle Shanahan coming over from Atlanta to San Fran, which is where Bobby Slork was, you know, uh, when he was coaching. He also mentioned that just watching guys run that route, it's slot work. So for me, it's getting better in the slot. Add that to your bag, nothing to it, just a route. Now, I do want to mention, when Kyle Shanahan arrived in Atlanta as a coordinator back in 2015, Julio Jones saw a huge increase mm. in snap usage in the slot, going from 233 in the four seasons prior to 455 in two years under Shanahan. Do I think we're going to see uh, 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 100, 200, <laughs> 300 yard, you know, snaps in the slot this year from Nico? I don't think so, simply because. They got real slot receivers on this team right now. Mm -hmm. But I think giving him the opportunity to be versatile, not just being outside as much. Uh, I forgot the number that I had for uh, Nico Collins. But in the first two years of his career, right under 100 yards played, 100 snaps played in the slot. So kind of limited in terms of what you want him to do uh, – in the, in the terms of being creative and on that offensive side of the ball. So I think Nico is in a position where last year, if you really watched his tape, not the numbers, not necessarily the production, but if you watched his tape, he got a whole lot better from his rookie year. Didn't mm -hmm. really get an opportunity to have the numbers and production behind it because of the style of offense and the lack of quarterback play and injury. He's already acknowledging that he has to stay on the field. The quarterback play will presumably be much better. And the fact that he's mentioning Julio Jones and how much he was utilized in the slot tells me that behind closed doors, they are talking about doing things in a little bit more creative manner to help guys get some of these one-on-one -on -one matchups or these matchups that they can beat out against maybe the lesser defender. Uh, so that's what I love to hear the most about Nico Connors. And I love the fact that we are hearing how much – he is getting these passes completed down the field. Didn't mm -hmm. get an opportunity to see much of those in the first two years of his career due to quarterback play and the lack of opportunity consistently getting that ball in the air for Nico. And so uh, those are some of the things. Again, he's acknowledged his own part, and he's kind of acknowledging what he is expecting to see from Bobby Sloak, seeing these clips cut up of Julio Jones and – how much his productivity increased. Julio had a career year, I think, that first year with Kyle Shanahan in Atlanta. Yeah, I think, I, think, and nine TDs. I think that was also the year they went to the Super Bowl, too, if so, I'm not mistaken. Listen, if not the not first year, the him, second year. Right, I'm not calling him the second year because by that time, Kyle was ready to go to San Fran. That's why he stopped running that football in the Super Bowl. <laughs> Thank you. But – by no means am I saying Nico is the next insert great receiver, which in this case we're talking about Julio Jones. But I am going to say Nico will be insert a much better player to the eye because of the numbers and productivity productivity that will follow Nico Collins by the end of this season as long as he stays healthy. You talk about the numbers really quick. In two seasons, Nico Collins has recorded 927 receiving yards and three touchdowns. Um, I think if he stays healthy, better quarterback play in the offensive um, style that we are expecting to see out of Bobby Slowitt, I think that he could come close to matching his career numbers in year three. I'm not saying he about to go out there and almost record a thousand yards, but if I'm saying number wise, you know, I think what a career best 
700 receiving yards, three touchdowns. I think that is realistic for Nico Collins. And if he can go out there and do that, and John, as you alluded to, playing someone in the ballpark to what, 15 games that you said, I think that is definitely going to be a successful year for Collins. By the way, he would only need to average 59 yards per game through 17 games to reach 1,000. Also, I'm also mm -hmm. on record by saying that uh, – Nico Collins and Davis Mills, that connection left about 250 yards at the very least on the field last year because of the lack of uh, ability to get Nico, ball, Nico Collins the ball consistently. So you saying? No, I'm not saying. I'm just saying. I'm not, <laughs> oh, okay. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. Welcome back in Locked On Texan listeners and viewers that are watching us from YouTube. And if you're listening to the podcast, going on your morning drive, morning mm. jog, or if you're just enjoying a cup of tea. Thank you guys for listening and watching. Uh, really quick, Hassan Ridgeway and Denzel Perriman returned to OTAs on Tuesday. They have been out due to injury, but those guys were back, so I wanted to let you know that information before we close out today's show. Shaquille Griffin's Practice debut, what does that actually mean for Steven Nelson, who as of right now would like a new contract with the Houston Texans? He is on a contract for this year, right? And he did just hire athletes first to be his agent. They are taking over. <laughs> Shout out to those guys. But did, did, Shaquille, did Shaquille Griffin look like you guys would sacrifice Steven Nelson for him, or is he still a depth guy right now? This is also his first practice, right? Yeah, this was his first practice. He did look rusty. Like I say, he had his moments. I believe he had like one pass deflection. Um, I can't remember which quarterback it was, Davis Mills or CJ, or maybe Case Keenum, because he was running with one, two, and three teams. Um, but he looked rusty. He had his moments. Biggest thing for him on yesterday, he was called for not one, but two pass interference calls. I think the biggest one came during 11-on-11 11 11 drills. Um, it was a pass interference call between him and Nico Collins, <laughs> since we just finished talking about him. And, um, you know, but this Shaquille Griffin situation is interesting. John, we talked about his signing a couple of weeks ago and what it could possibly mean for the Houston Texans. You view him as a depth guy. I view him as a guy who, who you know, has a slim but realistic possibility to overtake um, Steven Nelson as this team's number two corner. Um, at the time, I really didn't know whether or not how realistic that was going to be. But as of right now, um, Steven, Steven Nelson has, has been a complete no-show doing, once again, voluntary OTAs. Um, it would not be that big of a deal to me if, according to these reports from Aaron Wilson um, of KPRC, reported, I believe, one day last week that he is seeking a new deal, a new deal that he does deserve, by the way, because last year he played really good for the Houston Texans. However, the biggest alarm is going to be next week when mandatory mini camp take place. And that is going to be okay. Whether or not Steven Nelson is going to show up. If he shows up, I think everything is going to go, go on as expected. However, if he holds out, then we're really going to have to start taking a look at what this addition of Shaquille Griffin means to the Houston Texans. John, as you know, you talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Um, Shaquille Griffin has had an up and down career up until this point. A lot of inconsistencies uh, at times look very good. Look like he could be one of the top corners in the league. Then there's times, majority of the time due to injuries, um, he doesn't sustain that play. But here in the city of Houston, as of right now on yesterday, you know, I, I think he has an opportunity, but it's going to all depend on what goes on with Steven Nelson. Thank you guys for checking out today's episode of the Locked On Texan podcast. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Locked On Texans, as you can see. Also, subscribe on YouTube under the name Locked On Texans. Like and comment. Follow me on Twitter at John underscore Hickman 12. And as always, I'm your host, Cody M. Davis. Please remember to follow me on Twitter at Cody Davis underscore 24. Once again, that's Cody, C-O-T-Y-D-A-V-I-S underscore 24. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, peace.